Amishgate today. I'm going to be reading to you The Giant Bear, an Inuit Folktale by Jose Angutingernik. Sorry, I'm not going to say that name properly. I apologize. Eva Weiderman. So there's a foreword, and I think it's very important for you to pay attention because this is a story from the Inuit territory, and if if anyone has been paying attention, there's a big, big um, iceberg that has broken off, so it's important for us to listen to the Inuit. Inuit ancestors lived in a very different world. When we listen to the stories that have been passed from generation to generation, we cap we catch glimpses of this ancient time. We are told that when the world was much younger, many strange beings populated the circumpolar regions of the world. Great giants moved across the Arctic landscape. Malevolent ogresses hunted the small and the weak. Shy marine races hid below the protective sea, waiting for an opportunity to steal children and countless other Preternatural things crawled, swam, flew, and lived in this ancient place. We are told that some live here still. One of these powerful creatures is mentioned in the traditional stories of many of the Arctic regions, the giant polar bear. Some storytellers refer to this giant marine beast as ice-covered bears on account of their heavily iced fur. In other regions, however, these giant marine Animals are known as the Nanurlurk, Nan, oh, sorry, Nanurluk, Nanurlurk. So massive were these animals that they are often compared to the huge icebergs that populate the Arctic waters. These colossal bears were powerful swimmers and could also move quickly over the land. The Nanurluk were the only prey that offered the great Arctic giants any sport. You see, the great giants could walk across the rivers and kick over mountains. Regular polar bears seemed like helpless lemmings to them, and whales were as fragile as sculpin in their hands. The giants craved the excitement that came from hunting creatures as powerful as themselves. For a while, this legendary world was held in balance. Giant bears with equally, and there's a beautiful illustration. Powerful giants to hunt them, keeping their numbers in check. But eventually the world changed. The great giants began to disappear. There were few of these mighty hunters left to hunt the Nanerlut. And for a short time, these ursine Behemoths had no predators and were able to hunt in Arctic seas and coastal areas without challenge. The Nanerluk had huge appetites to go with their massive bodies. They hunted whales, seals, walruses, and everything else they could get into their mouths, including Inuit. Due to the Nanerluk's size, these bears were almost invulnerable to the attacks of Inuit. Some stories even tell us that their fur was so heavily covered by ice that even arrows and harpoons could not penetrate it. The icy armor coupled with the bear's size, strength, and speed made the Nanarluk greatly feared. As feared and invulnerable as these giant bears may have been, they could still be killed. Several stories tell us of how Inuit outsmarted these colossal foal as you will see in the following story shared by well-known known storyteller Jose and I'm not going to be able to pronounce his name I'm very very sorry Angutinergernik I apologize Neil Christopher Igalud Nunavut so the pronunciation guide Aglu a breathing hole in the ice that is created or kept open by a marine mammal. I igloo, a winter dwelling made with snow blocks. Nanerluk, a giant polar bear. Nanerluk, Nanerluk. Nanerluit, giant polar bears, plural, more than one. Okay, here we go. 
My grandfather was full of stories. Some of the stories I cannot remember, but there are some that I can, and this is one of them. There was once a husband and wife living alone by the sea. However, they soon found out the couple was not really alone. One day while out hunting for seals, the man found a large hole in the sea ice. When he looked down into the hole, he could see a giant bear sleeping deep in the water. This bear was a nanner look. And this hole in the ice was the Nanarluk's igloo, an opening that it kept clear of ice so that it could breathe. But breathing was not the only use the bear had for this igloo. It would also use this hole to climb out of the water and onto the ice to hunt. The man knew that no matter how capable a hunter he was, facing a Nanarluk head on would be very dangerous. He would have to devise a plan to protect his camp. The man did not want to be spotted by the Nanarluk, so he crouched low next to the opening of the igloo and began scooping water out of the hole and letting it pour over the icy sides of the igloo. Slowly, the water froze and the walls of the Nanarluk's igloo became thicker and thicker, making the hole in the ice smaller and smaller. The man then pushed snow into the open water of the hole, slowly filling it until the hole was very narrow, too narrow for the Nanarluk to fit through. Then he retreated to his camp and told his wife of the monster living under the ice and of his plan. The two of them worked quickly, pouring water onto their igloo's entrance and walls in the cold air. The water hardened the snow, making the igloo thicker and stronger. The couple hoped that this would protect them if the bear came to their camp. When they were satisfied with the work, the hunter gathered his knife and harpoon and started to make his way back towards the igloo, or sorry, towards the igloo to face the sleeping bear. As he left, he asked his wife to stay inside this covered igloo where it would be safer. Now the ice around the Nanarluk's igloo was thick and strong and the walls of the man's igloo were just as thick and just as strong. The hunter knew what he had to do next. Here he is. See him over here? See the sleeping bear in the igloo, little hole? As he neared the igloo, readying his knife and his harpoon, the hunter whispered to himself, now I will let the Nanarluk know what I've done. The man took a deep breath and leaned forward so that his shadow fell onto the giant bear's face. He wanted the bear to notice him. And eventually the Nanarluk became aware of his presence. Ooh. As soon as the Nanarluk spotted the hunter, it quickly swam up to its igloo. But just as the hunter had hoped, the hole was too narrow for the bear to pass through. It viciously clawed at the near newly frozen ice and slowly the hole began to widen. After a few moments of clawing at the ice, the Nanarluk tried to climb through the hole, but it was only wide enough for the huge bear's head. This was just what the hunter had hoped for. As soon as he saw the monster's head, he used his harpoon to stab at its eyes and nose. Soon the Nanarluk was bleeding badly. Enraged, the Nanarluk continued to claw furiously at the hole. Every time the hunter had the chance, he slashed and stabbed at the huge bear. He knew that the Nanarluk would soon free itself from the ice. This would be his only chance to wound the giant. Look at that giant. Finally, the Nanarluk pulled itself onto the ice. Face to face with the huge bear, the hunter thought about running, but he did not. The bear was bleeding badly and didn't seem to see or smell the hunter. Confused, it growled, then simply turned and wandered away. The hunter was then certain that the bear could not see him 
or track is sent. So he followed the huge footprints and the trail of the blood across the ice and onto the land. The hunter tracked the Nanarluk as it stumbled across the landscape, blind and without the ability to smell, the great bear ambled slowly without direction across the land. Eventually, the Nanarluk collapsed onto the ground. Several hours later, the hunter found the huge bear's body. The meat from this bear would provide him and his wife with, with food for many, many days. Because of the hunter's resourcefulness and courage, the couple survived and prospered. And that is the story of how one hunter outsmarted the great Nanner Luke. Oh, look at the baby huskies and the little baby, the family. The end. If you haven't already, please subscribe to my YouTube channel, all under case Christine Andrew. Also, thank you to the Pemberton Library.